Hi, my friends. Welcome back. We are going to keep reading Leon and the Spitting Image by Alan Kurzweil. Remember, I don't own the copyright to this book. We're just reading it out loud together for educational purposes. So the last time we read, um, Leon and his class had taken a field trip to a medieval museum and they were learning about the tapestries and the sewing and there's a little bit of conflict between Miss Hagmeyer and Miss Jaspero. Remember, Miss Jaspero is the art teacher at school and she's Lily Matisse's mom. So we're going to pick back up with chapter 14, The Masterpiece. After the unicorn animiles came greyhounds, and after greyhounds came stallions. Once the stallions were corralled in the finished bin, lions had to be made, then lambs, then falcons. With each new project, Miss Hagmeyer changed the eyeballs on her cape and moved the spools onto the counting house tally and closer and closer and closer to May. Naturally, she kept dishing out the usual fourth grade fare, math, English, social studies, science, but none of those subjects pleased her as much as the sight of a completed animile dropping into the finished bin. Miss Hagmeyer monitored Leon with extra special attention. She was forever asking him to straighten a crooked limb, thin a bulging belly, redo a substandard seam, and still, Leon's SPIs remained borderline. His promotion to fifth grade was far from guaranteed. That wasn't the only thing bugging Leon. Where were all his animiles ending up? This mystery drove Leon and the rest of the class nuts. But try though they did, Miss Hagmeyer's students never managed to uncover even the tiniest detail about their teacher's sideline business. Then, one day in April, all that changed. I found out where the hag's taking our animiles, Lily Matisse told PW and Leon while swinging on the jungle gym. Mom overheard her making arrangements in the teacher's lounge. What kind of arrangements? Leon asked. Shipping arrangements, said Lily Matisse. She was on the phone talking about a shipment of animiles, and she was looking through a black binder that said SOV on the cover. What's SOV? PW asked. Lily Matisse shrugged. It's not like Mom to go over and ask her. She hasn't spoken to the hag since the cloisters blow up. But she did check the phone book. All she found was the number for the Society of Ventriloquists. A society of vampires would be a better bet, said Leon. Or a school of victims, PW suggested. I saw the hag leaving yesterday with another garbage bag full of animiles. And when I checked the finish bin this morning, it was empty, right? Said Lily Matisse. Bingo, said PW. Someone has got to stop her, said Lily Matisse. Yeah, said Leon. Someone should deposit her in the finished bin. After recess, Miss Hagmeyer began class by writing two words on the blackboard. Master Peace. Can anyone tell me what this means? She asked. You may recall I used the phrase during our visit to the Hall of Unicorns. A forest of hands sprouted up. Miss Breed? An awesome thing? That's a start, said Miss Hagmeyer. But what's the nature of the awesomeness? What exactly makes a masterpiece a masterpiece? The forest of hands fell. Miss Hagmeyer had to answer her own question. A masterpiece is a special object crafted by an apprentice to gain entrance to the guild. I suppose you would call it a medieval final exam. The words final exam instantly made the whole class antsy. Settle down and let me explain, Miss Hagmeyer said. Suppose you were a lad living in the Middle Ages and you were sent off to make wagon wheels. Where would you go? Pencils twiddled and feet tapped, but no one spoke. You would undertake an apprenticeship with a master wheelwright, said Miss Hagmeyer, and that master would teach you his craft much the way I have attempted to teach you mine. As an apprentice, you would start with the basics, tend the fire, fetch buckets of water, sweep curlicues of wood off the ground. After a year of tending and fetching and sweeping, you might get to shave down the spokes on a wheel. After another year, you might actually begin to make wheels. And after making hundreds and hundreds under the master's strict supervision, you might be allowed to strike out on your own. Why would you want to strike out? Henry Lumpkin asked. P.W. turned to Leon and rolled his eyes. Striking out on your own has nothing to do with baseball, Miss Hackmeyer specified. It means you would become independent. You would start to work by yourself and for yourself. Oh, said Lumpkin. But to earn that right, you would first need to be declared a master. And how would that happen? Silence. I'll ask again. How does an apprentice become a master? Miss Hackmeyer tapped the blackboard with her chalk. By making a masterpiece, Leon guessed. Bravo, Mr. Cecil, Miss Hagmeyer replied coolly. To join the company of wheelwrights, an apprentice would have to make a piece worthy of a master. In other words, a masterpiece, a few students muttered. Miss Hagmeyer gave a nod. Naturally, apprentice wheelwrights weren't the only ones creating masterpieces. Apprentice bookbinders created them, as did apprentice goldsmiths and apprentice tailors. Now, does anyone know where I might be going with this? Antoinette's hand darted forward. You want us to make medieval masterpieces, don't you, Miss Hagmeyer? That is correct. Each one of you is to create an animile that confirms your command of the stitches of virtue. 
an animile that says, I am a nimble fingered master ready to handle fifth grade. What do we have to make? PW asked. Ah, said Miss Hackmeyer. That is a crucial part of the challenge. Masters must have vision. They must create on their own without guidance. You mean no worksheets, said Lily Matisse. I mean no worksheets. And no handouts, said Thomas. And no handouts, Miss Hackmeyer confirmed. You must design your final animile from scratch by yourselves. Draw up plans for a goshawk if that was what tickles your fancy. Stuff a quail, piece together a patchwork pony. The choice is up to you, I will not intervene. In fact, I do not want to know about your project until they are complete. A buzz spread through the room. No worksheets, no handouts, no instructions, no surveillance. Just keep one thing in mind, Miss Hagmeyer said. Masterpieces, both in design and execution, must celebrate the skill of the master. When are they due? Antoinette asked. The day of the carnival, Miss Hagmeyer answered. That gives you a little more than one month. Leon enjoyed his freedom for a couple of days, but independence soon became a burden. With the possibility of flunking looming, he couldn't decide what to make. Leon thumbed through an illustrated encyclopedia of imaginary medieval beasts. The book was filled with crocophants and dragons and other mythical creatures. It even pictured a rude gargoyle that looked just like the one grimacing in the cloister's downspout. Yet none of the beasts, gargoyle included, inspired Leon. He asked for suggestions at the hotel. What about a llama, Leonito, Maria said. Maria had a soft spot for llamas. They were called her native Peru. Not medievalish enough, said Leon. What about a tiger, Emma Ziesel proposed. We've got the amazing Lothar staying with us in July and he's bringing his entire act. I could ask him for a few whiskers. You could add them to your creature. July's too late, Leon moaned. Don't torture yourself, sweetie. I'm sure you'll think of something. But Leon did not think of something. And worse, Miss Hagmeyer caught wind of his waffling. Have you at least drawn some sketches, she asked one afternoon. No, Leon admitted, I can't seem to come up with anything. One must exercise one's fingers to exercise one's mind, Miss Hagmeyer said unhelpfully. But no ifs, ands, or buts, Mr. Cecil. If you can't complete your masterpiece this year, you will have plenty of time to do so next. Is my meaning clear? Yes, said Leon, feeling a terrible sense of despair. Now repeat after me. I will make Miss Hagmeyer a masterpiece. I will make Miss Hagmeyer a masterpiece. Miss Hagmeyer shook her head. Not good enough. Say it again, only this time with feeling. Leon forced himself to say, I will make Miss Hagmeyer a masterpiece. And that's when it hit him. While parroting his teacher's silly words, Leon suddenly fingered out what he wanted to make, what he had to make. Got it, he cried as he dashed back to his desk, dizzy by possibility. His idea for a masterpiece emerged, fully formed, like one of those spongy toy sea creatures that burst out of the tiny plastic capsules when they were dissolved in hot water. Except Leon's animile was a whole lot rarer than the octopuses and angelfish hatched inside a bathtub. It was also a lot more complex. Although the idea for the masterpiece announced itself faster than a butterfly sheds its cocoon, actual construction took a good deal longer. Leon spent three full days working on preliminary sketches and another two tracing and cutting the patterns for the arms, legs, torso, and head. Once that was done, he drew up a list of materials. Most of the items he needed, pantyhose, cloth, yarn, eyes, came from Ms. Hagmeyer's supply cabinet. But there were a few things Leon couldn't track down at school, and that's where Maria came in. She located all the hard to find stuff, like the special flexible wire coat hangers he used to make the animal's bones. For six days, Leon sewed like a demon. He had never worked so hard or cared so much. His effort was fueled by excitement, worry, determination, and poor brother's salt and cracked pepper kettle cooked potato chips, part of the April shipment from the Worldwide Chip of the Month Club. And with that effort came a new sense of confidence. Leon discovered his fingers behaved themselves in ways they hadn't when he was blindly following worksheet directions. Independence and conviction made the seven stitches of virtue easier to execute. In fact, Leon mastered every one, including the pesky overcast stitch needed when finishing off seams after the animile had been stuffed. Chapter 15, The Spitting Image. Leon cut the loose threads from the last seam of his masterpiece and emerged from the back room behind the reception desk. He was bleary-eyed but proud. Perching his completed animile below the All Pets welcome sign, he said, hey mom, what do you think? Emma Ziesel's jaw dropped. If that isn't a masterpiece worthy of a master, I don't know what is. Really? Really. Let him try and say you lack fine motor skills now. Heck, you've got Rolls Royce motor skills. Well, we'll find out in two weeks at Carnival. That's when the hag tells me if I pass. I wouldn't wait, sweetie, said Emma Ziesel. Showing Miss Hagmeyer the masterpiece early might put her threats to rest. Leon took his mother's advice. 
The following morning, he left for school with his masterpiece snugly secured inside one of Frau Hafenraffer's pastry boxes. The choice of carrying case wasn't all that smart. No, it's not dessert, Leon had to tell Napoleon and P.W. and Lily Matisse and everyone else who saw him clutching the tantalizing box. But despite the constant pestering, he refused to lift the lid. He wanted to show Miss Hagmeyer first. Leon tried to catch her at check-in, but that plan was stymied because of a fire drill. He decided to take another stab after dismissal when he could display the masterpiece more privately. For the rest of the day, the pastry box didn't leave Leon's sight. He grasped it between his knees while practicing a Gregorian chant in music. He cradled it in his lap throughout art class as he worked on his knight's costume. He even clung to the box during a pit stop at the boys' room where he awkwardly squeezed it under his arm while taking care of business. Lily Matisse and P.W. cornered Leon during recess. Come on, said P.W. Best friends don't just keep things from best friends. Show us what's in the box. I don't want to jinx things, said Leon. Just a quick look, Lily Matisse pleaded. We won't touch. Cross my heart. After school, I swear, you guys will be the first thing, first to see my thing once I get the hags okay. Thanks a bunch, said Lily Matisse. Yeah, said P.W. Leon felt guilty. Okay, he said at last. A peek, but just a quick one. He lifted the lid. Lily Matisse's eyes widened and P.W. cried, whoa, gruesome. The last class before dismissal was P.E. One hour to go, Leon told himself as he entered the gym. The wait was giving him butterflies. Coach, he said, can I sit out? I've got a stomach ache. Sure thing, Coach Kasparitas told him. He knew Leon was no faker. So while the rest of the class did laps and vaulted the pommel horse, Leon watched from the bleachers, the pastry box wedged safely between his knees. After 10 minutes of warm-ups, the coach blew his whistle and shouted the single most potent word in the English language. Dodgeball! What type, coach? P.W. yelled. Team multiple, the coach cried back. You and Lumpkin to choose sides. P.W. immediately turned to the sidelines. Hey, box boy, get over here. Leon hesitated. Come on, I need you. Leon waffled a bit before abandoning his precious cargo to join P.W.'s team. Once the class was divided up, the coach walked onto the court carrying three spanking new rhinos. Can anyone here tell me the object of dodgeball? He asked. Elimination, a few kids called out. The coach bent down and positioned the balls along the center line, then stood up and cupped a hand around one ear. Excuse me? Elimination, a few more kids called out. Say again? Elimination, the whole class screamed. Right, said the coach. He settled his substantial rump on the top row of the bleachers, not far from Leon's pastry box, and made a mighty blast on his whistle. The fourth graders charged the rhinos. Plum, missed, blam, you're out, boing, gotcha, zooft, miss me by a mile, zam, womp, busted dorko. Hey, Lumpkin, the coach yelled from his perch, clean up your language, no trash talking in my gym. The field of battle thinned pretty quickly. An unlucky ricochet, pang, caught P.W. on the leg. A sneak attack from the flanks, puff, winged Lily Matisse. When the clock ran out, only Lumpkin and Leon remained alive. A chant rose up from the sidelines. Sudden death, sudden death, the chant grew louder. Sudden death, sudden death, the coach blew his whistle. Go for it, he cried. Yoo-hoo, sir pantyhose, Lumpkin said menacingly, moments after the coach extended the game. Get ready to be crowned. Dream on, Leon replied. The coach again shouted down. Guys, you know the rules. No teasing, no taunting. Lumpkin turned to the coach as if to apologize, then whipped around and launched a ball, hoping to catch Leon off guard. His cheap shot failed. Leon darted out of the way. A defensive pattern quickly emerged. Leon held on to one ball and Lumpkin held on to the other. Only the third and final ball moved between them. Neither Leon nor Lumpkin was willing to find himself empty-handed. But then, two minutes before the end of overtime round, Lumpkin aimed a shot at Leon's backup ball and hit it with such force that both rhinos bounced off the back wall and returned to Lumpkin's side. A collective groan rose up from the sidelines, followed by the kind of somber, respectful silence that accompanies an execution. <clears throat> Lumpkin, now in possession of all three balls, made Leon zigzag, lurch, duck, and jump with a series of fake throws. Throughout it all, Leon stayed alert. He wasn't about to fall for the slow ball, fastball combo that had nailed him in the past. From the bleachers, P.W. suddenly screamed, Sidewinder! But the warning came too late. Lumpkin had already recoiled and released his patented low-flying missile. A split second later, the missile smacked Leon in the stomach with a brutal puck. He ignored the searing pain. Only one thing mattered, catching the ball before it touched the ground. The rhino rebounded against his knee and sailed upward. 
Leon stretched his arms forward and dove like a champion swimmer. At the very moment he felt the sandpapery texture of the rhino against the tips of his fingers, the hard, smooth surface of the gym floor began burning the skin off his elbows and knees. But when at last the rhino stopped defying gravity, it did so in Leon's battered hands. He had caught the ball, which meant he had won the game and Henry Lumpkin had lost it. The bleachers erupted in cheers. P.W. was the first to reach Leon and offer congratulations. You pulpified him, he cried. No such word, said Lily Matisse, arriving a few seconds later. Pureed him, maybe, or made Lumpkin pumpkin soup out of him, but Leon, still panting, cut them off. Keep your voices down. He, he might hear. Lumpkin was standing all alone, 20 feet away, scowling at his spare rhino as the magnitude of the upset slowly penetrated his stegosaurus-like brain pan. Bruised and scraped though he was, Leon nevertheless approached his defeated arch enemy. Good game, he said, extending his hand. That last toss really did a number on me. Lumpkin rejected the handshake and reached for the rhino, angrily whipping the ball at the leather pommel horse on the far side of the gym. It hit the grip of the vaulting apparatus and ricocheted toward the bleachers, knocking Leon's pastry box into the air. The box went in one direction, the contents in another. Leon broke free of his friends and sprinted for the bleachers. By the time he got there, it was too late. Coach Kasparitis had already reached through the bench slats and retrieved the exposed masterpiece. Geez, Cecil, the coach gasped. Did you make this? Yeah, Leon said, out of breath. Amazing, said the coach. This is major league work, kiddo. I mean it. Let's hope Miss Hagmeyer thinks so, Leon said. Are you kidding me, said the coach. She'll have to. I mean, what choice does she have? This doll, it's, well, it's her spitting image. And if you've never heard that expression before, it means it looks exactly the same as her. So it sounds like Leon's masterpiece is a doll of Miss Hagmeyer. So we will find out for sure and maybe some more details tomorrow when we start with chapter 16. See you guys then.